40-year-old Virginia Freeman lived in Brazos County, Texas in 1981. She had a husband and two children, 11-year-old Brad and 14-year-old Betsy. Virginia worked as a real estate agent. She had a strong presence in a local community and was a volunteer for the American Red Cross as well as the local Girl Scouts. Virginia was also part of the First Baptist Church Discovery Program at a Texas A&M University. On December 1st, 1981, Virginia received a phone call from a man who wanted to buy a house from her. The man claimed he had a cash to buy the house. Virginia was eager to make the sale, so she confirmed the appointment, even though she had dinner planned with her family and friends. Before heading to the appointment, she drove to her house first. Virginia wanted to tell her children that she would be a little late for dinner that evening. She told them that they should get dressed and that she would see them a little later than planned. Virginia then drove to the appointment in her white 1981 Chevrolet station wagon. At 6 pm, Virginia's husband Charles began to grow concerned. She had not made it home yet. He called the real estate office. He then learned that Virginia went to the appointment at 2 pm and had not come back yet. Charles and a friend of his decided to go look for Virginia at a house as she was showing that day. In front of the house, they made a gruesome discovery. Virginia's body was found in a driveway of the house. She had been stabbed in the neck 11 times. Virginia was also choked so hard that her neck was actually broken. She had also been struck across the head multiple times. Investigators believed it was a slab of concrete that was used. It was estimated that she passed away just before 4 pm that day. Investigators also concluded Virginia and the client never made it inside house. The ground around her body indicated that a struggle took place. Virginia also had a lot of defensive injuries on her hands. DNA belonging to her attacker was found under her fingernails. The medical examiner who performed the autopsy clipped her fingernails during the examination. It was then carefully sealed in a plastic evidence bag. Investigators knew that it could be used later when DNA was more advanced. The local area was canvassed extensively by investigators. They were looking for any possible leads. Brazos County Crime Stoppers offered a reward of $1,000 for any information that would lead to an arrest. Investigators also asked anyone living in a local area if they maybe saw Virginia driving her white station wagon or maybe saw a suspicious man. Even though the house was located in a very secluded area, some witnesses did come forward. Thanks to this, investigators were able to create a composite sketch of the man they were looking for. The image was circulated, but no one recognized the man. One of the co-workers of Virginia said that a man had a country accent. But as this took place in Texas, it did not really help investigators. The co-worker also said that a man did not specifically ask for Virginia. He just said that he wanted to see the house. Virginia was on a rotation list, which meant that any new clients who were not yet on the books would be assigned to her. No one was arrested for the crime, and a case eventually went cold, and it would stay that way for a very long time. In 2018, the case was looked into again, as DNA was more advanced by then. A company by the name of Parabon Nanolabs were asked by investigators to help solve the case. Parabon has a service called Snapshot DNA Analysis. This means that I can take DNA of a suspect that cannot be traced using DNA databases and create an image of what he might have looked like at the time of the crime and also what he might look like in the present day. It is not a cheap service. It can cost up to $4,000 for the images. National Geographic decided to pay so the snapshot image could be made of the person who took Virginia's life. In turn, National Geographic would get permission to make an episode about it as part of the Nat Geo Explorer series. Using the DNA found under Virginia's fingernails, 
had belonged to the suspect, Barabon then created these images. The first image showed how the suspect would have looked like at the age of 25, as it was believed that was roughly how old he was at the time the crime was committed. Parabon can also make use of genetic genealogy. It is a process where they take the DNA of the suspect and then they look at public DNA databases such as JetMatch. Using this technique, it led investigators to female relatives of the suspect, two second cousins. After some more investigating, investigators believed James Otto Earhart took the life of Virginia. James lived in Brazos County at the time of the crime, in 1981. He was convicted in May 1987 of abducting and taking the life of 9-year-old Candy Janelle Kirtland. On August 11, 1999, he was executed in Huntsville, Texas. Fortunately, investigators found a son of his that was still alive. The son then provided a DNA sample that could be tested against that of the DNA found on Virginia. On June 25th, 2018, investigators held a press conference. It was then announced that they were able to confirm that James did indeed take the life of Virginia Freeman. Sheriff Chris Kirk had this to say. The solving of this cold case after so many years of investigating brings relief and closure for the Freeman family, Virginia's friends, the local real estate industry and our community. It is an incredible example of the tenacity and perseverance of the investigators involved in this case. Also, we were blessed with opportunities to take advantage of emerging technologies in forensic sciences that led to a breakthrough. We are elated to finally close this case. Our one regret is that we cannot put handcuffs on James and prosecute him for what he did. In 1996, Janet March lived in Nashville, Tennessee, along with her husband Perry, their five-year-old son Samson, and a two-year-old daughter, Zipporah. The family lived in a large house on a five-acre lot in Forest Hills, which is an affluent suburb in Nashville. Janet's parents bought the house for Janet and Perry. Her parents, Lawrence and Carolyn Levine, were extremely wealthy. Lawrence was one of the most prominent lawyers in Nashville, which made him socially prominent in a city's Jewish community. Janet and Perry met while they were studying at the University of Michigan in the early 1980s. Lawrence paid Perry's tuition so that he could study at a Vanderbilt University Law School. Janet and Perry got married in 1987. The year after that, Perry graduated and took a job at Bass, Perry and Sims. Their son Samson was born in 1990 and Zipporah was born in 1994. Perry did not last long at his work. He sent a lot of notes to one of his co-workers, where he praised their body and said it captivated him. The co-worker then let management know about all the notes that she had received. Perry was caught in the act of delivering one of these notes and he was fired. He also had to pay the woman $25,000 to avoid a lawsuit against him. The payment and what he did, he kept as a secret from Janet. Perry then started to work for Janet's father, and he told everyone he got fired because of a conflict with a co-worker. Even without Janet knowing, the two of them started to argue a lot by 1996. Janet even got a book about divorce. On August 14, the children's nanny remember that Janet was not her usual self and that she spent the whole day on her computer. The next day, friends of Janet who saw or talked to her also noticed that she seemed distracted and afraid of Perry. On August 15, two cabinet workers installed two countertops in Janet and Perry's home. They would be the last people outside of Janet's family to see her alive. That evening, according to Perry, the two of them argued again. Janet then announced that she was leaving for a two-week vacation. She packed a couple of things, gave him a list of things to do while she was away, and left the house just after 8pm. Janet's parents believed what Perry had told them, 
even if it was unlike their daughter. On August 25th, it was Samson's birthday party. When Janet did not appear, it raised some red flags. On August 29, Janet's parents finally notified the Metropolitan Nashville Police Department that Janet was missing. This was now two weeks after she was last seen. Detectives looked at local hospital admissions and Janet's credit card and bank accounts, but found no trace of her. The first break in the case came a little over a week later, on September 7, when Janet's Volvo was found backed into a parking space at an apartment complex roughly 5 miles from the house. Inside was Janet's handbag, a suitcase with clothing and a small bag. It appeared as if the items inside the car was carefully positioned by someone. Investigators who interviewed Perry also noticed that he talked about Janet in a past tense, indicating that he knew she was not alive anymore. He also did not allow anyone to search the house. On September 16, investigators got a search warrant however, and made their way inside. They found that a computer's hard drive had been forcibly removed and could not be found. Investigators also found that a week after Janet was last seen, Perry went to a local tire store to get new tires for his Jeep. The owner of the store told him that his existing tires were in excellent condition, but Perry said that he wanted a different brand. After the search, Perry took his children and went to live in Chicago. He made a very incriminating remark to one of Janet's friends. He asked her what would she think if he took Janet's life and disposed of her body while the children were sleeping. By this time, investigators did not believe Janet was alive anymore, and Perry was their main suspect. They used army helicopters, divers and cadaver dogs to look for Janet's body. In November, Perry also did not attend Janet's memorial service, and he did not allow the two children to go. The next few years were just filled with lawsuits between Perry and Jeanette's parents. They now believed that Perry took a daughter's life. They wanted custody of the two children, and they also wanted to make sure that Perry did not have a right to any of Jeanette's possessions. Carolyn Levine found an envelope in a forest deal's house. Inside was copies of the notes Perry had sent to his co-worker. Investigators and Jeanette's parents believed that Janet had discovered these notes and demanded a divorce and that Perry then took her life. In 1999, Jeanette's parents were given visitation rights. When they went to pick up the children in Chicago, they learned that Perry went to live in Mexico with his father. His father lived close to Guadalajara in Mexico. In 2000, Janet's parents went to Mexico. They picked up the children from their school and took them back to Nashville. Unfortunately, this was seen as kidnapping under Mexican law and they had to take the children back to the man that they believed took their daughter's life. Janet's parents continued working hard to prove that Perry is guilty even though no body had been found. Finally, in 2005, Perry was arrested and taken back to the United States. Janet's parents also got full custody of her grandchildren. Perry told detectives that he would plead guilty if he would be given a sentence of 7 years or less. He also wanted to know what the evidence was against him, but investigators told him nothing and took him to the county jail. Perry immediately approached Russell Farris, who was another inmate. Perry said that he would pay Russell's bond if he would take the lives of Janet's parents. Russell pretended to go along with the plan, but he was also telling everything to his lawyers and investigators. Perry also said that his dad would help with anything that he needed. His father explained to Russell exactly what they need him to do. His father was then told by Russell that he did what I asked for and needed a place to stay. The father then arranged to meet Russell at a Guadalajara airport, but when he got there, FBI agents detained him to take him back to the United States. In June 2006, Perry's trial began. This was now almost 10 years after Janet was last seen. It seemed like it would go either way, but then a video was shown in a courtroom. It showed Perry's father confessing and telling everyone what happened. His father said that Perry did take Janet's life 
and the two of them took her body to Bowling Green, Kentucky. Barry's father then buried her in a large pile of brush he found. He was not able to take investigators to the exact location, but I found his account to be credible anyways. On August 17, 2006, a jury reached a verdict after 10 hours of deliberations. Perry was found guilty of taking his wife's life. He was sentenced to 56 years in prison. His father was sentenced to 5 years in prison, but passed away just a few months later at the age of 79. Perry will not be eligible for parole until 2040. His daughter Zipporah still sometimes has contact with him, but Samson, who is now an engineer, wants nothing to do with him. An art gallery at Nashville's Gordon Jewish Community Center was named for Janet as a memorial. Morgan Harrington was born on July 24, 1989, in Charlottesville, Virginia. In 2009, 20-year-old Morgan was a student at Virginia Tech. On the evening of October 17, Morgan and a few of her friends attended a Metallica concert at a John Paul Jones Arena at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. During the concert, Morgan left to go to the bathroom and somehow ended up outside of the arena. She was not allowed back in because of a no-return policy. Morgan then called her friends who were still inside to tell them that she was going to get a ride home. Morgan was last seen by witnesses hitchhiking at half past nine on a nearby bridge. She was never seen alive again. Morgan's handbag was later found in a parking lot at the University of Virginia. Inside was her cell phone. On January 26, 2010, Morgan's remains were discovered by a farmer in a remote area about 10 miles from the arena. It was never made public in what manner her life was taken, but it is known that it was violent and that she was assaulted. In April 2010, it was made public that a t-shirt had been found about a mile from the arena that belonged to Morgan. It was what she had on when she was last seen. Morgan's DNA was found on it, as well as DNA belonging to an unknown man. Investigators found that a DNA from the unknown man belonged to a suspect in an assault case from 2005 in Fairfax, Virginia. The victim from that case described her attacker as an African-American male in his mid-twenties, roughly six feet tall, weighing between 180 pounds and 220 pounds. He had a beard and a mustache. A composite sketch was made of the man, hoping that someone could identify him, but no one came forward with any valuable information. Finally, in 2014, a different cold case led to progress in Morgan's case. Hannah Graham was a student at the University of Virginia in September of 2014. She went missing after going to a restaurant outside the campus with her friends. Investigators looked at surveillance footage of the area and saw an African-American man following Hannah. They also saw that a man forcibly had his arms around Hannah at one point. He was quickly identified as Jesse Matthew. Investigators arrested him a week after Hannah was last seen. His DNA was taken and it was found that his DNA matched the DNA found on Morgan's body and it also linked him to the 2005 assault case. In October 2014, Hannah's remains were located in an abandoned house in a nearby county. In March 2016, he confessed to all of his crimes and he was sentenced to four life sentences. As I only touch briefly on the Hannah Graham case, I will be covering it in more detail in a future video. Alan Brzezinski was a 20-year-old woman from Massachusetts. She was studying at Wheaton College, also in Massachusetts. In January 1980, she went to Colorado and started working as an intern for a Denver radio station. She was really just starting her life. Helen was living with her friend at her aunt's house in Englewood. On January 16, 1980, Helen went to work. After work, she took the bus like usual. 
she was not seen again after leaving the bus station. Helen's aunt got worried when she did not arrive home and reported her missing. It did not take long for police to find her. Her body was found the next day in a field. She had been stabbed. Investigators believed that she was abducted right after she left the bus station. DNA from a male was found at a crime scene. Unfortunately, in 1980, DNA technology was not very advanced and they could not identify the man. They did, however, store the DNA so they can one day use it again when DNA technology has advanced. Helen did not know a lot of people in the area since she only lived there for two weeks and did not have any known enemies. Investigators did not receive a lot of leads and the case went cold. In 1998, the DNA were uploaded to their database after a DNA profile could be created, but it did not match to anyone. In 2017, her case was reopened and investigators tried again to solve her case. They uploaded the DNA to jetmatch.com and found a couple of potential family members of the suspect. One of the family members they came across was Rob Deal. Rob was very eager to help. He explained his entire family tree as best he could and gave them a sample of his DNA. The investigators then used the help of CC Moore and Parabon Nanolabs to find a family member who would give them an exact match. In December 2019, they really narrowed it down to James Curtis Clanton. He was a very distant cousin of Rob. James was a truck driver living in Lake Butler, Florida. Investigators saw that he had a criminal history and found that he was on parole for an assault in Arkansas after serving four years in prison in 1980. He was released to live in a Denver home of a former counselor who offered to help him. This meant that he was in the area when Helen's life was taken and that he had a violent history. Investigators followed James for a few weeks. They retrieved a beer mug that he was drinking from at a bar. The DNA was tested and it was an exact match. Early in 2020, James was arrested. They are now also looking into other possible crimes he could be responsible for. Helen's sister, Janet Johnson, is really the only living close relative and she was ecstatic to hear the news of the arrest. Janet, now 70 years old, said, I want people to know what a special person Helen was. She was my best friend and she had a bright future ahead of her. 80-year-old Alice Ryan lived in Greenville, South Carolina in 1988. She was known as a wealthy socialite, a widow and a great aunt of Greenville Mayor Knox White. On October 8, 1988, Alice left her home for chemotherapy. She had been diagnosed with lung cancer a few months earlier. Later in the day, she made her way back to her home. Alice's daughter decided to visit her that day, and when she arrived at Alice's home, she found her mother's car gone and the back door was ajar. Inside, she found Alice's body. She had been stabbed numerous times. Her car and a few other items had been stolen. It was a crime that infuriated the community. Investigators were really intent on trying to find the attacker right away. Every lead they had ended up in a dead end, however, and the case went cold for many decades. Recently, investigators reopened the case. They found DNA evidence belonging to an African-American man on one of the items that was collected and stored from the crime scene. It was submitted to the Combined DNA Index System, also known as CODIS. In November 2017, investigators were notified of a CODIS hit to a matching DNA profile. The DNA profile belonged to a 50-year-old man living in America's Georgia. After some more investigating and DNA testing, Brian Keith Munns was arrested. The motive for the crime seems to be burglary. It was not classified as a hate crime. Greenville Police Chief Ken Miller added to say, It validates that we should never give up on a case. We should never give up hope. We should never give up our efforts to try and bring justice to those that were harmed and closure for their families. 
Tanya van Kellenborg was born on March 7, 1969, in British Columbia, Canada. In 1987, 18-year-old Tanya met 20-year-old J. Roland Cook, who was also from British Columbia. The two of them started dating. By November, the two of them had been in a relationship for about six months. On 18 November, J. and Tanya left in his father's bronze 1977 Ford Club van. They left for an overnight trip to Seattle, Washington. Their plan was to buy parts for Jay's father's business. It was their first trip together, and they planned a romantic weekend. They took a 4 pm car ferry to Port Angeles, Washington. After disembarking from the ferry, they drove south into Hoodsport around 8 pm. After that, they drove past Allen, most likely on their way to Bremerton, Washington. It is believed that they then boarded another car ferry had went from Bremerton to downtown Seattle. Jay and Tanya were supposed to make it back home on November 19, but they did not. On November 20, they were reported missing. Four days later, on November 24, Tanya's body was found on the side of a road near Algar in Skagit County, Washington. She had been assaulted, bound with plastic ties, and shot. Jay was nowhere to be seen, so investigators believed and he could be responsible for what happened to Tanya. The day after Tanya was found, on November 25th, her wallet and keys were found discarded near the Greyhound station in Bellingham, Washington. A few blocks away, the van was found. Inside were plastic ties of the same type used to bind Tanya, plastic gloves and Bremerton Seattle tickets. Tanya's camera was missing and has never been recovered. On November 26, Jay's body was found, nearly 60 miles away from where Tanya's body had been found two days earlier. He had been beaten with rocks and strangled. After some more investigating, DNA could be collected from an unknown man inside a van. Investigators were unable to find a match in any of the criminal databases. It was also believed that the attacker was familiar with the prison system. The lack of a match, despite a potential prison background, could be explained by the suspect having been incarcerated before DNA collection from criminals became commonplace or technologically possible. Jay and Tanya's family members received a series of greeting cards written by someone who claimed to be the attacker. The cards had postmarks from Seattle, Los Angeles and New York. It was all written by the same person. In 2010, investigators announced that a writer of the cards had been found. He was a 78-year-old Canadian transient who had mental health issues. It was confirmed that he had no connection to the crimes. On April 11, 2018, investigators asked Parabon Nanolabs if they could help solve the case. They were able to create a composite sketch of the attacker using his DNA that was found on Tanya's body and inside the van. Parabon also made use of genetic genealogy. They submitted the DNA of the suspect to the public website jetmatch.com. They were able to create the family tree of the suspect. This led investigators to 55-year-old William Tabbitt. He worked as a truck driver. Investigators followed him around and found a paper cup that he had used. DNA was taken from it and matched the DNA found on Tanya's body. On May 18, 2018, the Snohomish County Sheriff announced that William had been arrested. His parents lived just seven miles away from where Jay's body was found. In June 2019, William was found guilty of taking the lives of Tanya and Jay. He was given two sentences of life in prison as he is currently serving in a Washington State Penitentiary. Tracy Lynn Hammerberg was born on March 7, 1966, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. During her childhood, her family moved to Southville, Wisconsin. She attended Port Washington High School. On December 15, 1984, 18-year-old Tracy was babysitting at a house in Southville. Thereafter, she walked to a grocery store to meet her friends. Tracy and her friends then drove to Quaid's Tavern in Port Washington. Then she and her friends went to a party in Grafton, Wisconsin. 
they played a beer drinking game and smoked weed. After midnight, Tracy left to walk home. The walk was about 4 miles. Tracy never made it home. Her body was found dumped on a snowy driveway on Maple Road in Grafton. She had head injuries and had been assaulted. More than 400 men were eliminated as suspects using DNA testing. In March of 2019, investigators made use of genetic genealogy to absolve the case. They were able to create a DNA profile from skin that was found under Tracy's fingernails that belonged to an unknown man. The Los Angeles Federal Bureau of Investigation also helped out. Finally, in August 2019, they were able to confirm that Philip Cross to Tracy's life. Philip was a Wisconsin man who passed away in 2012. He was 21 years old at the time of the crime. Those who knew Philip said that he was abusive and aggressive towards others. Kamaya Mobley was born on July 10, 1998, in a hospital in Jacksonville, Florida. Her parents are Shinara Mobley and Greg Aiken. Greg was imprisoned at the time for drug possession and delivery, and also because he was 19 and Shinar was 15 at the time of Kamaya's conception. Eight hours after being born, Kamaya was abducted by a woman who impersonated the nurse. The woman dressed as a nurse assisted and talked with Shinara Mobley, and then later walked out of the room with Kamaya in her arms. The abductor was believed to be about 25 years old and possibly wore a pair of glasses and a wig. Investigators from a Jacksonville Sheriff's Office followed more than 2,000 leads from as far away as Nova Scotia, but none of them led to baby Kamaya. Unbeknownst to Kamaya's family and investigators, the woman who abducted Kamaya was Gloria Williams. She was in an abusive relationship and miscarried a child a week before the abduction, which is believed to be her motive. Gloria created a new identity for Kamaya. She was raised as Alexis Manigo in Waterboro, South Carolina. She graduated from Colleton County High School. In 2017, investigators reopened the case of Kamaya Mobley. A computer-generated composite was then created to show what a now 18-year-old Kamaya Mobley would look like. This image was then distributed to the media. Investigators received a few tips that led them to 18-year-old Alexis Manigo. Her DNA was taken and it matched the DNA that was taken from Kamaya Mobley after she was born. 51-year-old Gloria Williams was then arrested in South Carolina and extradited to Florida. She was charged with kidnapping and interfering with custody. In 2018, Gloria pleaded guilty to kidnapping. She admitted that she acted alone in a 1998 abduction. On June 8, 2018, Gloria was sentenced to 18 years in prison for the kidnapping of Kamaya Mobley. She is currently serving her sentence at her Hernando Correctional Institution. Kamaya still communicates with Gloria and calls her mom. She also said that Gloria raised her with everything she needed. Kamaya connected with her biological family over FaceTime initially. Then in December 2019, Kamaya moved to Jacksonville, Florida to be closer to her family. In January 2020, a movie of the case was made called Stolen by My Mother, The Kamaya Mobley Story. A surprising fact that was made public was that Kamaya knew she had been abducted and what her real name was since she was 16. Gloria told her everything because Kamaya could not get a social security number. The two of them kept the secret for two years until investigators figured it out. Shinara did sue the hospital for oversight and was awarded $1.2 million. Not everything has gone smooth since it was discovered that Alexis is actually Kamaya. For instance, she still prefers to go by Alexis and her relationship with Shinara has been strained because Kamaya still often contacts Gloria. Recently, it appeared as if the story has a happy ending after all. Kamaya uploaded a picture of Greg and Shinara with the caption, Parents. 
14-year-old Tina Fells lived in Pleasanton, California in 1984. She attended Foothill High School. On April 5th, Tina was walking home from school. She normally took the bus, but some of the other students had been picking on her, so she decided to walk home instead. Tina took a shortcut, walking on a path that connected Astor Court to Lemonwood Way. Then she used the I-680 underpass to her valley trails home. But Tina would never make it there. Her family got worried and called 911 to inform investigators that Tina was missing. Her body was quickly found close to the underpass. Tina had been stabbed 44 times. Investigators found DNA from the attacker at a crime scene. Investigators could however not find a solid suspect and the case went cold for some time. In 2011, investigators submitted that DNA was found at a crime scene to the CODIS database. It led investigators to a man that was already in jail, Stephen Carlson. Stephen was 16 years old at the time of the crime. He attended the same school as Tina. Stephen also lived right next to the crime scene and he told people at a party in 1986 that he took Tina's life, but later claimed that he was joking. Stephen said that he was innocent, but he was convicted in 2014 for taking the life of Tina. He was sentenced to 26 years in prison. It was only in October 2020 that he confessed to what he had done. He sent confession letters to Tina's family. Here are some of the things he said in the letters. This letter of my deepest apologies is way overdue. I was living in denial for many years, not being able to believe or take responsibility for taking your life on that day of April 5th, 1984. I want you and your family to know you did absolutely nothing to deserve what I did to you. That is what makes what I did so callous and horrific. On the day that he took her life, he was also picked on at school. He had an altercation with the school football team, where he ended up in a dumpster. I remember being full of rage at the way all my classmates were laughing at me. Everything happened so fast. I remember going to the kitchen and grabbing a butcher knife. I walked across the street into the field. That is where Tina Fells was. You were just minding your own business, having to walk home by yourself and having to walk past that scary drainage tunnel could have also been terrifying to a 14 year old girl, but only to be horrifically surprised by me attacking you. Tina's brother, Drew Fells, who was just 8 years old when he lost his sister, said that he is glad Stephen confessed. It is nice knowing that he is admitting it. That part makes me feel better to get confirmation, but it does not resolve anything. Classmates of Stephen and Tina were not surprised that Stephen was guilty. They said that his nickname was Creepy Carlson in school. 17-year-old Nancy Noga lived in Cerroville, New Jersey in 1999. She attended Cerroville High School. On January 7, Nancy went to work at a rag shop store in a nearby town of Aldbridge, New Jersey. When she did not make it back home, her family got worried and called the police. They sent out flyers and immediately went searching. Five days later, at approximately 9 in the morning, Nancy's body was found in a wooded area behind a minimal plaza shopping center in Ernston Road. She was found wearing a purple Arizona jacket, a dark v-neck sweater, blue jeans, black and white platform sneakers, and carrying a purple backpack. DNA from an unknown man was collected at a crime scene. An autopsy revealed that Nancy passed away due to blunt force trauma. Nancy's friends described her as a nice, outgoing girl who was friendly and helpful. She had plans to enter the military after high school and later attend college. When her body was found, it shocked the blue-collar community. Fear quickly spread, especially among girls in town who were afraid to walk alone at night. For more than two decades, investigators worked the case but got no closer to catching the suspect. It was only recently that investigators made use of genetic genealogy that progress could be made. In September of 2021, Middlesex County Prosecutor Yolanda Sicone and Cerebral Police Chief John Zabrowski announced to the public that a case is now closed. 
49-year-old Bruce Szymanski was arrested at his home in Barnegat, New Jersey, in connection to the case. His DNA matched the DNA found at a crime scene. He is currently being held at a Middlesex County Adult Correction Center awaiting trial. John Zabrowski had this to say. This arrest is the result of decades of hard work by so many detectives and officers. We never stop following up on leads and today with the arrest of Bruce Szymanski, we are one step closer to bringing a degree of justice and closure to the family. Forty-seven-year-old James Summers lived in Jefferson County, Missouri with his forty-seven-year-old girlfriend Alice Wise in 2004. Just after 8 p.m. on April 27, the police were called to their home. Officers found James's body against a detached garage. He had been shot in the back and the face. About 20 feet away from him was the weapon, a 22 caliber handgun. It belonged to his girlfriend Alice. Investigators decided to question her. She said as she was in the home showering when she heard the shots outside. Neighbors claimed to be outside around the time of the shooting and no one recalled seeing any unfamiliar faces in the area. A recreation of the shooting also revealed that gunshots would not be audible from the shower. Alice also gave conflicting stories. Investigators asked her if they could test the rope she was wearing for gunshot residue and she told them that she had to go to the bathroom. When they told her no, she claimed that she shot the handgun earlier that day for the first time in 20 years. She also told her cousin four years after James's life was taken as she had always been curious if shooting someone was as pleasurable as sex. She also said that if she was ever arrested, she would pin it on her father had recently passed away. When the cousin asked Alice why she shot James, Alice replied, there is little difference between love and hate. Despite all this evidence against Alice, investigators decided not to arrest her as they felt they needed more evidence. That all changed in 2021 when a press conference was held by the Jefferson County Police Department where it was announced a 65-year-old Alice Weiss had been arrested. She is still proclaiming her innocence. Let me know in the comment section if you think she is guilty or not. Missouri Attorney General Eric Schmidt had this to say, While getting the current violent crime issue under control is incredibly important, it is also crucial that we do not neglect or forsake the often forgotten victims of violent crimes whose cases have not been solved or have gone cold. Fifteen-year-old Farrah Carter lived in Broward County, Florida with her family in 2002. They had recently started renting a house on Southwest 27th Street. On May 22nd, Farrah was home alone. Later in the day, her mother and sisters entered the home. They made a gruesome discovery. Large pools of blood covered the tile floor and the wall of the family room. A chair was knocked over, a glass jar shattered on the floor, and a couch had been pushed across the room against the window and blinds. In Farrah's bedroom, her family found her body. She had multiple stab wounds. Investigators found a shoe print inside the house and also an ATP tour hat that had not belonged to anyone in the family. A man across the street told investigators he saw Farah talking to a man at the front door on the morning her life was taken. The man wore a hat similar to the one found inside the house. He tried to make his way inside the house but he gave up and left. It was then believed that the same man later made his way into the house successfully. A thousand dollar reward for information was issued and flyers were sent out around town. Investigators also tested items they had collected for evidence, but were unable to make any DNA matches. The case soon went cold. In 2019, investigators decided to make use of genetic genealogy. They submitted the items they had collected into public DNA databases. This time, they found a match. It led them to 56-year-old Joseph Pollard. He had a long history of violence against women. In the summer of 2004, just two years after he took Farah's life, he was sentenced to life in prison for an unrelated crime involving kidnapping and burglary. Before that crime, he was involved in a lot more crimes 
but never spent a long time in prison. In May of 2002, he was a free man on probation when he made his way to Pharaoh's home to end their life. He is currently serving his life sentence at a Taylor Correctional Institution. Farah's family appreciated the fact that the case is now resolved, but a development did not ease their decades-old pain. 77-year-old Alma Jones lived in Wake County, North Carolina in 1977. She was very well known in the community, with friends and family all over the neighborhood. On Christmas Day, her family came to visit. They made a startling discovery. Inside of Alma's home, they found her body. She had been assaulted, so investigators were able to retrieve DNA belonging to an unknown male from her body. Investigators questioned a lot of people, but was not able to get any useful information, and the case went cold. In 2011, the case was reopened, when the case file was stumbled upon. Recently, with advances in DNA technology, investigators finally made progress. Using genetic genealogy, they were able to identify Paul Crowder as the man that took Alma's life. He lived just a few houses away from her. Crowder was not a suspect in the initial investigation, but he was questioned along with almost every other man who lived in the neighborhood at the time. Crowder passed away in 2015 at the age of 72. He had previously served time for an unrelated crime in Massachusetts. Investigators found one of his living family members and collected a DNA sample from them. After some more DNA testing, it was confirmed that he is indeed a person who took Alma's life. Raleigh Police Detective Jerry Falk said, It was just a brutal crime. This case kind of stood out as one we really wanted to work on if we could. That question mark had had been there for so many years. It is always a great feeling to be able to know and put a name with that person who is responsible for this crime. As technology continues to change and get better, I think that there is hope that we can solve many more cases just like this. I would love to solve the next one just as much as I loved solving this one, because they are all important. Twenty-two-year-old Christy Bryant lived in National City in San Diego, California. She came to the area to serve in the Marine Corps until medically retiring in 1972 as a result of a car accident. By 1974, she was working as a clerk at a 7-Eleven. On July 31st, Christy was working alone at a store on 702 Highland Avenue. During her shift, a customer went in and discovered Christy's body. The police were immediately called. Investigators found that Christy had been stabbed numerous times. They collected evidence from the crime scene. Investigators noted that it was not just Christie's blood that was found at the crime scene, but also blood belonging to an unknown man. DNA testing was not available back then, so little could be done and the case went cold. In 2008, the suspect's blood was submitted to the San Diego County Sheriff's Department crime lab, but no matches could be made. Recently, investigators turned to genetic genealogy to help solve the case. The National City Police Department joined forces with the San Diego County District Attorney's Office. They got a genealogist to create a DNA profile and submit it to public DNA databases. It led them to 69-year-old Carlin Edward Cornett. He was found living in Las Vegas, Nevada. Cornett was arrested and taken into custody on September 14, 2021. He was booked into Las Vegas jail and will be extradited to San Diego to face the charges against him. Christie's sister, Holly Bryant, was just 20 years old when her sister's life was taken, that is to say. It is a relief, but it's also unsettling because he's reliving so much of it. I do want him to pay for what he did, and I hope his family can accept it as well. Sergeant Mark Siegel, who was the lead detective on the case, said, It never truly went cold. Detectives have always been looking at it, poking at it, evaluating it, reviewing and seeing what can be done. We don't forget about it, and it is important that people know that the law enforcement agencies will do whatever they can to seek justice on behalf of the family. San Diego County District Attorney Summer Stephan, who played a very important part in solving the case, said, We are committed to solving cold cases in collaboration with our law enforcement partners. 
Pursuing justice for families who lost their loved ones to violence is a priority for us. No matter how many years have gone by, we never give up and continuously use the latest in crime scene investigation techniques to hold criminals accountable. 15-year-old Emily Jeanette Garcia lived in San Antonio, Texas in 1993. She was staying with her friends in the northeastern part of San Antonio. On February 25th, a woman's body was found near Crane's Mill Road and Canyon Lake in Comal County, Texas. The woman had been assaulted and strangled. During the autopsy, it was discovered that she had been pregnant for nearly four months when her life was taken. A year later, in 1994, she was identified to be Emily Garcia after a family member watched a local news report and contacted police. Many years went by without any updates in the case. In 2017, the Kamal County Sheriff's Office reopened the case. In 2021, the Texas Rangers Unsolved Crimes Investigation Program also began trying to identify a suspect. The renewed investigation led to investigators interviewing several people at Emily New. One of those people was 50-year-old Thomas Ray Galindo. New information uncovered in the interviews finally led to the arrest of Thomas. He was arrested at his home in Kamal County on September 10, 2021. The US Marshals, Gulf Coast Defenders and Fugitive Task Force were the ones that arrested him. Thomas is currently being held in a Kamal County jail. He was 21 years old at the time of the crime. It is not known yet how he was acquainted with Emily. Sheriff Mark Reynolds was one of the first people at a crime scene. It was his birthday when he got a call about a body being found. This is what he had to say about the arrest. There was very little in the way of identifying her. It took quite some time, even after the autopsy. Personally, I'm very glad an arrest has been made and Emily Garcia is not forgotten. I hope this brings closure for her family. Joanne Hull was a talented singer in Australia and was well known in the country in the 1970s. By 2007, 51-year-old Joanne worked as a secretary for a security company. She lived in an apartment in Eustyle, Melbourne with an ex-boyfriend she had broken up with. On April 21st, Joanne's body was found inside of her apartment. She had been beaten and strangled. Despite paramedics' efforts to try and save her, she passed away at a scene. Neighbors came forward and said that on that day they heard a lot of arguing between Joanne and her ex-boyfriend. His name is Paul Charlton and he was 52 years old at the time. On the day her life was taken, Joanne told him that he had four weeks to move out. He was interviewed by investigators and said that he left the apartment to take a dog for a walk. When he returned, he saw what happened to Joanne and called the police. To investigators, it definitely seemed that Paul was responsible for what happened to Joanne, but they needed more evidence. A witness came forward claiming that they saw a man acting strange in the vicinity of Joanne's apartment around the time her life was taken. A medical examiner determined that Joanne passed away at roughly 9pm. Charlton called the police after 11pm. This meant that he would have had to be out walking the dog for more than two hours, which is not impossible, but a bit unlikely. Despite an extensive investigation, investigators did not get useful leads and the case went cold. In December of 2020, investigators appealed for more information from the public and said that they are close to having solved the case. Then in January of 2021, Paul Charlton was arrested at his home and taken into custody. Detective Inspector Tim Day said this, Police haven't forgotten about Joanne and the community shouldn't either. If you know anything, now is absolutely the time to come forward. We are appealing to anyone who may have overheard any conversation with any person indicating who is responsible for what happened to Joanne. In June of 2021, he was released on bail as he apparently does not pose a risk to the community. The media tried to question Charlton, but he lashed out at them and swung his walking stick around, posing no risk to the community, of course. Investigators have not fully explained why they arrested him after all these years, 
but I have said that in 2020 they put listening devices in the home of Charlton and things he said played a role in them arresting him. Charlton is now awaiting trial where investigators believe that they have enough to get a conviction. 19-year-old Krishana Logan lived in Toledo, Ohio in an apartment on a 2400 block of Robinette Avenue. She worked as an exotic dancer but had plans to move to Texas and attend college. Sadly, she would never get a chance to follow her dreams. On April 15, 2000, her body was found inside of her apartment. She had been assaulted and strangled. Investigators collected DNA evidence belonging to an unknown man from the crime scene. The next day, on April 16, Krishana's boyfriend was arrested in connection to the case. The DNA found ruled him out as a suspect however, and he was let go. Despite DNA being able to rule people out, it was not advanced enough to identify the suspect, and the case went cold. Recently, investigators reopened the case and made use of genetic genealogy to finally make progress. A DNA profile could be created of the suspect. Codis did not deliver any matches, so the DNA was submitted to public DNA databases. On January 4, 2021, the Ohio Bureau of Criminal Investigation notified Toledo Police and the Lucas County Prosecutor's Office that a match has finally been made for the DNA found at a crime scene back in 2000. It matched the DNA of Kenneth Marshall, who lived in Hammond, Indiana. Not only did his DNA show that he is responsible for what happened to Krishana, but it also linked him to two different sexual assault cases. Marshall was arrested on January 15 by the Hammond police. Lucas County called case task force members interviewed him after his arrest. He was then taken to Ohio and booked into the Lucas County Jail on January 25th. Four days later, on January 29, Marshall appeared for an arraignment by video, and his bond was set at $1.3 million. 60-year-old Starlet Bell, who now lives in Texas, remembers April 15, 2000, like it was just yesterday. She was at work as a nurse in Toledo when she learned one of her nieces, Krishana, lost her life. My other niece called me and is screaming at the top of her lungs. At the same time, I heard on the TV, a young lady's life was taken, and in the name came across the screen, Bell said. Her life was cut short at a worse time, because she was so excited about a new start, coming to Texas and going to college. It was all taken away from her. Starlet believes that Marshall knew Krishana, because of the work she did as an exotic dancer. I actually believe he followed her from there. I don't believe it was random at all. I heard rumors of her being afraid of a guy who really matched Marshall's description. When I saw his picture, I actually said to my sister that it looks like the guy she used to describe. Bell said that Krishana is at peace now, and it is time her family got peace as well. They never gave up hope for answers, and hope that Marshall gets life in prison if convicted. 45-year-old Albert Woolfolk lived in Columbus, Ohio in 2003. He had a wife and four children. On the morning of July 18, Albert's mom and one of his employees found his lifeless body inside of his house. He was strangled and stabbed more than 20 times. Because he was stabbed so many times, it was believed that the attacker knew him. A large television was stolen from the house, just leaving a cable box that was found toppled over. Investigators were able to collect fingerprints from the crime scene on a cable box that did not match Albert or anyone that was in the house, showing that it most likely belonged to the attacker. A timeline was then created by investigators. They found that Albert went to a local bar on the evening of July 16 and was last seen leaving the parking lot with his Jaguar convertible. His life was taken shortly after he made it back home. Despite years of investigating, a suspect could not be identified. It was only recently that the fingerprints collected at a crime scene could be used to identify someone. Investigators identified 47-year-old Alvin Barfield as the man whose fingerprints were found at a crime scene. 
detectives from the Columbus Police Department found at Alvin lives in South Carolina. On January 21st, 2021, the U.S. Marshals Fugitive Unit arrested Alvin Barfield at his home. New details have also now been revealed. When Albert was last seen in a parking lot, he was with two black men and one white man. It was also revealed that a second set of fingerprints were found inside the house, and also the television was too heavy for one person to carry. It is believed that Alvin is the white man Albert was last seen with. Investigators now hope to find the other two men or identify a second set of fingerprints. Alvin is currently in a Muskogee County Jail. During an interview, he denied any involvement and said that he did not know Albert and was never inside of his house. Albert's wife was quoted as saying, It has been very, very hard over the years. It has been 17 years now, and it is something you go through every day. You never forget it, but you try to continue on. Forty-seven-year-old Bonnie Baker lived in Denver, Colorado in 1998. She stayed with her boyfriend, Crispin Nene Perez. Bonnie worked at a Ford restaurant in Morrison, Colorado. In June of 1998, Bonnie and Crispin attended a party with friends, where they celebrated that Bonnie received a pay raise. During the evening, Crispin got angry when Bonnie was dancing with other people. The couple left the party together. Bonnie's last words to one of her friends was, It would be better if I just go now, or it would be worse. That same evening, someone called 911 to say that a woman's life was taken in her apartment on West Louisiana Avenue. The caller said that a culprit was Crespin Nene Perez, and he was driving to Mexico with the woman's body in a trunk, and would dump the body somewhere along the way. Investigators made their way over to the apartment that Bonnie and Crispin shared. They found broken glasses and plates covering the floor and the kitchen table was overturned. The 911 caller was a neighbor and told investigators at a scene that Crispin told her, Something bad happened to us. You will never have to see Bonnie again because I'm going to make her disappear. It seemed clear to investigators what had happened. Bonnie and Crispin were arguing and he decided to take her life inside of their apartment. He then put her body in the trunk of his car and left for Mexico, as the neighbor said. Investigators tried to find Crispin or Bonnie, but to no avail. The neighbor gave a description of Crispin's vehicle. Two days later, a car matching the description and a license plate crashed near Globe, Arizona. The driver ran away. A witness identified Crispin as the driver from a photo lineup. The car was impounded and blood evidence was collected from the trunk. In July of 1999, just over a year after Bonnie was last seen, two boys were riding horses on Navajo land outside Manuelita, New Mexico. They discovered a human skull. Navajo Nation tribal police found more skeletal remains in the area. An autopsy failed to identify the person, but it was noted that the remains belonged to a female. The remains were then sent to the New Mexico Office of Medical Investigators, where it could be stored until DNA was advanced enough. In October of 2012, DNA police detective Kenneth Klaus was assigned to Bonnie's case that have been called since 1998. He called an FBI agent in New Mexico to discuss Bonnie's disappearance. The agent knew about the female remains found in 1999 and believed it could potentially be Bonnie. DNA samples of the skeleton were sent to Denver, and it matched known samples had come from Bonnie. In 2013, investigators found that based on the evidence they had, there were sufficient grounds to arrest Crispin. The problem was that he was living in Mexico at a time and would be difficult to get him back to Colorado. It took seven years to get him back to the US. In May of 2020, Crespin and a lot of other fugitives were handed over to America by the Mexican government. Preliminary hearings have been held this year. Crespin's family have testified that he has violent tendencies. I was not able to find any information on when the trial takes place, but one has to believe that investigators have enough evidence to get a conviction. A man broke into an apartment in San Mateo, California at around 4 a.m. 
on February 4, 1989. He then took a knife and climbed into the victim's bed. His face was covered with a bandana. He indecently assaulted her and then stabbed her. The victim somehow managed to convince the attacker to leave and she then called 911. The woman thankfully survived but was not able to give a description of the unknown man. DNA of the suspect was collected from her body and stored so it could be used later. In December of 2020, investigators used genetic genealogy to identify the suspect. He was identified as 55-year-old John Harris Jr. He was arrested in February 2021. He is currently booked in the San Mateo County Main Jail. His bond is set at $500,000. I hope that investigators try and see if he is responsible for any other crimes.